What is it that makes a church successful? What do you think makes a church a successful one? When I ask you what makes a church successful, do you instantly think about numbers, large crowds of people gathering together on a Sunday and at midweek meetings for worship? Or do you think less about the number of people and more about what they do? Are they involved in lots of ministries, both inside and outside the church? Or is a successful church perfectly in tune with the local culture so that you can bring your unbelieving friends along without feeling embarrassed? Or is influence the sort of thing that you think is important? Does the church have a grade A celebrity preacher that is admired nationally or even internationally? Or do you look at scripture and see what God says? Because ultimately this is what we need to be doing. Because as people, even as believers, we don't really have the authority to decide what is a successful church. We don't have the knowledge. We don't know what's really going on in people's uh, hearts. And we may be able to define what our dream church is like, but no more than that. It is the Lord Jesus Christ, the head of the church, who is able to determine what church is a successful one and what church is a complete failure. What is important to him is often not what is important to the people of this world. Sometimes even believers get the wrong end of the stick and we look at a church and think it's successful, but actually it's a complete mess. Our problem is that we often allow the things of this world to shape our attitudes, to shape our thinking, and we forget what scripture says. Here in Revelation chapter 3, we see the risen and exalted Lord Jesus Christ encouraging a church that is successful. And what makes them successful is not their size, it's not their ministry, it's not their cultural sensitivity or having a famous leader. What makes them successful, what earns them praise from the Lord Jesus Christ is that they are faithful They are doing what Jesus has asked them to do. And when we recognise that this is how success is defined in the eyes of Jesus, it means that any church, no matter how big they are, no matter how small they are, can be successful. So we have all sorts of lessons that we can learn from this church in Philadelphia. So let's start having a think about them and uh, with all of these letters, it's helpful to have an idea about the church and its situation because some of the things that are written here tie in with uh, what the uh, church was like and the town was like. Philadelphia itself was named after a member of the Pergamon royal family called uh, Atalus and he was known for having an incredible love for his brother. His brother was um, the uh, king of the area. And because of this, he was given the nickname Philadelphus, which means love for siblings. It was actually a fairly small city. It was located inland and it was there at the head of a valley that was incredibly fertile. And it was so fertile, they got lots of crops um, It was especially famous for its vines, Um, so they had lots of grapes, and it was famous for that. But this fertility came with a terrible cost, because the fertility came from a nearby volcano. It was getting coated with the ash and things every so often, and the city itself was built on a fault line, which meant that they got an awful lot of earthquakes, and they were quite big earthquakes. In fact, in AD 17, the city had been destroyed. But because it was in such a good spot and the land was so fertile, it was quickly rebuilt. But it meant that the people never had any real sense of permanence. 
because they always had to have that bag by the door so they could get out quick. Because as soon as there was an earthquake, all the buildings cracked and they were living outside the city walls until they could rebuild it. This was a city that never really knew how much longer it had left. Now we have no record of how the church was established here. Scholars suspect that it was planted by one of Paul's disciples. Paul's strategy had been to focus on the major um, centres of population um, in that part of modern day Turkey. And he planted churches. And then from those churches, the people would radiate out. Much like today, people go to the cities for work. They would go to the cities to trade. And then they go back home. They'd be converted in the cities. They'd go home and they'd set up churches. And they think this is how the church came to be in Philadelphia itself. And because they were part of the church, the broader church, it means that the Lord had his eye upon them. And as is typical with all of these letters to the churches, there is a description of the risen Lord Jesus Christ which ties in with his message to the church. Here we learn that Jesus is holy and true. And that trueness... That's really tied into that true love that gave the city its name, that love between siblings. The Lord Jesus Christ, he is true. And that pair of descriptions when put together, holy and true, is a description that's usually reserved for God alone in the Old Testament. So this is another one of those passages that reminds us of the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. It reminds us that he is the second member of the Trinity, the Godhead. And when we start looking at these Old Testament titles being applied to Jesus, we see that right the way through the New Testament, it's telling us quite clearly that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is divine. And he is trustworthy, he is faithful, he is true, he always keeps his promises. And when Jesus says something is going to happen, you know it's going to happen. Then we read that he holds the key of David. Now that's another Old Testament um, quote and the book of Revelation is filled to the brim with things drawn from the Old Testament. And the key of David is uh, a reference that goes back to um, one that's uh, a reference that's quite easy to remember really, um, Isaiah 22 verse 22. So if you wanted to remember that one's not too bad. And it's talking about an individual called Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah. And this Eliakim, um, who is one of several mentioned in the Old Testament, but this particular one was the king's steward, a servant of Hezekiah. And he was mentioned in our morning sermons not so long ago. He was one of the messengers that Hezekiah sent out to the Assyrians when they pretty much flattened all of the Judea and they were outside Jerusalem. And all those horrible insults were thrown at Eliakim. And he took the message back to Hezekiah and then Hezekiah sent him to the prophet Isaiah. So he has a prominent role within the Old Testament. And in Isaiah 22, there are some uh, prophecies about him. And it talks about this man being given the key to the house of David. And it's linked with great authority. He had the key to the kingdom, as it were. And he was able to use it to get things done. And this authority... It's just a picture of the greater authority that the Lord Jesus Christ has because he is the greater son of David. So the key to the house of David really belongs to him. Now, being a key holder always gives someone both authority and responsibility. A lot of the local shops downtown, they're always advertising for staff and they're always looking for someone to be the key holder. The key holder gets all sorts of um, perks. They get a little bit more money. But it means that when the alarm goes off at uh, 2 a.m. on a Sunday night, they're the one who's got to get out of bed and go in and uh, sort it out. So there's authority and there's responsibility. In one sense, the key holder gets to decide what happens within the building because they're the one who are letting people in. So being a key holder gives you great authority. And when we're talking about the key of David, we're talking about a far greater authority than what happens in a building. But we are talking about um, entrance to the kingdom of God, to salvation. And ultimately, that will lead to authority over all things. 
because we know that this creation was made for the Lord Jesus Christ and when he returns, he will inherit everything. So Jesus has this key of David. What he says goes, what he permits to happen will happen and if he wants to put a stop to something, he has the authority to do that. He has absolute power and he also knows all things. In verse eight, I know your deeds. Jesus knows everything we do and he knows our motives. And that's scary because we don't always know our own motives ourselves, but he knows us right down to the depth of our hearts. He knows all the things we do and he knows why we do those things. So the Lord Jesus can do whatever he wants and he knows everything about us. And this is always reassuring for believers because we know that whatever situation we find ourselves facing, it's not outside the control of the Lord Jesus. And um, we, he also knows where we are as well, how we really feel about something. And that's really helpful when we turn to him in prayer. So we have this description of the Lord Jesus, holy, true, absolute authority, who knows everything. And we need to remember that he is the one that we are called to serve. And that's important when we're, because we're thinking about a successful church. And when we all remember that we are servants of the King, we are servants of the Lord Jesus Christ, it helps us get the right idea about what success is. When we start looking to the world for their definition of success, are we really serving the Lord Jesus Christ? We are serving the Lord Jesus. It doesn't matter if you're a new believer sitting in church for the first time, or if you are the head of a denomination with hundreds of churches, we all have the same master. And he is a loving and gracious king. He is the one who became sin, who went to the cross and died and rose again, so that we could be rescued from sin, so that we could be forgiven. He loves his people. He is not some nasty slave driver who's out there to get all that he can from us. In this world, there's so many bosses who just want to exploit their workers, getting everything they possibly can from them and giving them the minimum in return. The Lord Jesus isn't like that at all. He has bled and died to save us, to bring us into his family. He loves us and he cares for us. So there is love at the foundation of our relationship with him. And he's on our side. He's like a proud parent who wants the child to do really well in school and reach their full potential. The Lord Jesus is not against us. Instead, through the work of the Spirit, he presents gifts to his people and gives them clear instructions to follow. And when we look in scripture, we see that some instructions are general, given to every Christian. And it's helpful for us to remember that then. Through the work of the law of the Holy Spirit, we're to be conformed to the image of Christ. And this means getting rid of sinful tendencies and being more and more like Jesus. In this world, we face um, temptations to sin from three directions. There's Satan and his hordes who will tempt us. There's the things of this world which will seek to seduce us. And then there's indwelling sin. We all have that sin, sinful desire still in our heart, what the Apostle Paul called the old man. And that just wants to sort of get in control and take us back to what we were. And fighting against that is really difficult. But when we're moving in step with the Spirit, he helps us to put these things to death so that we can be conformed to the image of Christ. And if we're honest with ourselves, most of the times we slip and make mistakes. It's not temptations from the devil, and it's not the seduction of the world, but rather something bubbles up from inside and causes those problems. So we are to be conformed to the image of Christ. Believers are also called to be a loving community that shows genuine care for each other. We are on the same side. We are on the same team. You know, it's hard enough being a Christian in this world without people arguing within it, with each other within the church. We need to be a loving community. We're also called to be a holy community. 
So we should personally be trying to put sin to death. And as a group of believers, it means that when we see someone who's doing something wrong and they refuse to change their ways, then it's right that we put a spotlight on them and call them to repentance so they can be brought to their senses and get back in step with what Jesus wants them to do. So we are personally to become more like Jesus. We're to be a holy, loving community. And all Christians are also called to be a witness for the gospel through word and deed, showing the love of Christ and telling others about the good news about Jesus. So those things are for every believer. But then he also gives specific instructions to individuals. There's a special place, a unique place, that each and every believer has in the kingdom of God. And we need to be sensitive to his voice and put this into practice. The Lord Jesus is the one who decides what gifts and skills and abilities that we get. And we're called to use these things for his glory. And we use these things for his glory by serving his people. So we are given different abilities and gifts in order to serve him by serving within the church. And we're all different. We've all got different skills, abilities and gifts. So to be faithful to our calling... It means that we should be seeking to do all of these things. We're not perfect, we make mistakes, but that is what we should be doing. And it's what Jesus expects from his people. And in the case of the church in Philadelphia, they had fulfilled this calling. The Lord Jesus, the holder of the keys, had placed an open door before them. He had unlocked a door of opportunity. And for this church, situated at the gateway to a fertile valley, controlling who went in and out of it, it's a very apt image, isn't it? And this church had gone through this doorway and they had been faithful. And this open door is considered by many scholars to be an opportunity to witness within the town to a specific group of people. Now, like other believers living in Turkey, being a Christian was hard work. There were the trade guilds and the imperial cults, all that was going on. And they also had an additional problem here. There was a Jewish synagogue that was filled with some quite liberal Jews. And we know this from Jewish writings at this time. Um, books written around this time describing how the Jews, the diaspora, had spread out across the Roman world. And uh, some of these Jews... They were trying to understand the scriptures and while they may have rejected the Messiah, they were looking at the Bible. But other Jews had compromised. They'd gone, um, well, they're described as liberal Jews. So they hadn't remained the distinctive people that God wanted them to be. Instead, they'd gone, oh, it doesn't matter. Join the trade guilds, it makes life easier. It doesn't matter if you burn the incense to Caesar. And what was so sad was, that they had opt-outs to these because they were a recognised religion. They wouldn't be persecuted by the Romans, but they joined in anyway. They weren't keeping the Jewish law, they were blending in with the people, and uh, they had clearly persecuted God's people as well. So these were people who had the word, and they were ignoring it, and then they were persecuting Christians. And um, this sort of explains verse 9, where Jesus says, I will make those who have the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews there or they are not, but are liars. I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. So the Lord Jesus is saying about these liberal Jews with their dodgy lifestyle, they're just pretenders. They're just false. And it's believed that this open door of opportunity given to this church is to reach out to these people. And we can see that some of them are going to recognise who Jesus is and how Jesus loves the Christians. And that means they're going to recognise that Jesus is the Messiah. The Jewish people had been waiting for hundreds of years for the Messiah, the anointed one, the special one that God had promised to send. And it's tragic that when he did arrive, the majority of the Jews missed him. Some were converted, the disciples, the followers of Jesus, the first people converted on the day of Pentecost, all of them Jewish people. But then as the church spread out um, of um, Jerusalem 
and into the surrounding regions, we see that more often than not, the people who were trying hardest to stamp out the Christian message were the people who were in the synagogues. So, real difficulty for them. But this church in Philadelphia, they had been faithful. They had an open door of ministry given to these people. They were to go to be a witness to them. And they were some of the hardest people to reach uh, that you could imagine. Yet, they are promised that measure of success. But this church had a problem. The problem is there in the second half of verse 8. Jesus says, I know that you have little strength. And this suggests that they are quite a small church that's made up of ordinary working class people. A group of people that were easily overlooked and just pushed to the side. They just didn't have the resources that they wished that they had. The bank account is empty. They don't have the key workers they want. They're running on a skeleton crew. If they were a ship, they would not be allowed to set sail because they didn't have enough people on board to man everything. They were weak. It looked like they couldn't do anything. And that's often how we feel. We look at the opportunities that we have to share the gospel and we just wish that we had better resources, more people, more help. But when we do this, we're relying on our own strength. When Jesus gives you an open door, you already have everything you need to faithfully walk through that door. Jesus is not going to open an opportunity to people that he hasn't equipped. He has given people the ability, the strength that they need, because he's given us the gift of the Holy Spirit, who works in us. If we step out in our own strength, even if we're strong, we're going to trip over our own feet and fall flat on our face. But when we step out, doing what the Lord wants us to do through the open door that he has provided, in his strength, in his power, then we are going in the right direction, faithfully using the resources that God has given us. And then we can expect to see great things happening. And the glory will go to the Lord Jesus because it is clear that he is the one who is at work. We need to be praying that we will be faithful in what the Lord has called us to do and pray that the Lord will equip us for any open doors that he sends our way. And when we do this, maybe we will receive a commendation like the uh, church in Philadelphia. Now, what a lovely thing to say. You have kept my word and have not denied my name. Such a faithful church will be rewarded by the Lord Jesus. But they are given some advice in verse 11. I, Jesus says, I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that you, no one will take your crown. When you're faithful, you've got to work to maintain it. You know, it's so sad because some people and some churches, they look back and they say, 20, 30, 40 years ago, we were doing these great things for the Lord. And today we're not doing anything. But we did it all the way back then. And over time, they've let it go. And that's not what the Lord wants. What they did in the past was great. But they still need to be faithful today. It may be that over time, what the Lord wants us to do changes. We know what it's like to get older so that we can't do the things today that we used to be able to do. Jesus knows all things. He knows what's within our power today and he won't expect us to go beyond that. So we are to be seeking to be faithful. So we have to hold on to what we've got, continue being faithful until the Lord returns. And then, we, as we look at this, we see that the Lord gives them promises for the future in verses 12 and 13. The church in Philadelphia will be protected from an hour of trial because of their patient endurance. Patient endurance is only ever shown by those who are small and weak. The big and the powerful 
quickly make it known when they're unhappy and they get things changed. But the weak, the overlooked, the ignored, who don't have resources and influence, have to learn the gift of patient endurance. Jesus knows and sees and values these things. We do not know what trial the church was going to face. It could easily have been a local natural disaster, regular earthquakes in that region, or it could have been one of the rounds of persecution that the early church faced. There were some quite nasty years ahead. And it may be, these promises may be looking forward to the return of Christ and the days of difficulty that will come on the whole earth. Whatever it was, they have a promise of protection. When it happens, they will be safe. They also have a further promise that looks into the future when they will be with the Lord. And here we have the same promise examined from different perspectives. They will be a pillar in the temple of God. They will never leave. They will have the name of God, the name of the city of God and Jesus' new name written on them. And all of these are pointing towards the believer spending the rest of eternity in the presence of God. And this will be their permanent position. Just think how stable one of those old pillars is in a region prone with earthquakes. They quickly topple over, don't they? But a pillar in the temple of God in the new heavens and the new earth will stand forever. Of course, this is a metaphorical description because we learn later on in the book of Revelation that uh, there is no temple in the new Jerusalem. And this is because God's people are his temple. But this description of being a pillar rather than just a brick in the wall is to be given a position of prominence with an important role supporting the roof. This is a position of honour in the new heavens and the new earth. Small and weak in this life, but of highly esteemed and honoured in the next. Far better than being great and honoured today than finding out that you've just been building with straw and wood when you meet Jesus. And then three times we see that they will have a name written on them. It's there three times in those uh, final couple of verses. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God. I will also write on them my new name. And to carry a name is to belong to someone. And in one sense, believers belong to the Lord because he has redeemed them with his blood. Remember, redemption is about buying back something which belongs to you. They will also have the name of the city of God, the new Jerusalem, placed on them, which is a clear sign of citizenship. They will finally belong. They will finally be home. And then they will also have the new name given to Jesus, which is a bit of a mystery. In Philippians 2 verse 9, Jesus is given the name that is above every name. And in Revelation 19 verse 12, the returning Christ has a name written on him that no one but he himself knows. Naturally, there's been various speculations about what this new name in Revelation 3 might be. But I think the most sensible suggestion is that this is a new name for Jesus, which will be revealed when he returns. For the church in Philadelphia, these promises must have stirred them up to action, to enhanced faithful perseverance, even when the going got tough. And it would have emboldened them to walk through the open door that Jesus had provided for them. For us, we need to learn from their experiences and we need to be ready. Sometimes the Lord opens doors and sometimes he closes them. Whatever the situation we find ourselves facing, we need to be faithful, even when that means patient endurance. As we look at our society, it seems that the door to evangelism is closing at the moment. Very few people are being converted from outside of the church. We are still seeing conversions, praise the Lord. But often the people who are being converted, those born into Christian families, it's getting harder and harder for people outside the church um, to come in. And when we do see people coming in from outside the church, they often have a Christian heritage from long ago. But so many people have turned away and they're just not listening. And our society is becoming increasingly hostile to the gospel. Our influence in society is getting weaker. Our call seems to be to faithful perseverance. Remaining faithful, even when the whole world is against you. However, we also need to keep our eyes peeled for the open door. 
Firstly, we need to ensure that we are being faithful to the Lord's commands. In our own life, we need to be seeking the Lord's help to get rid of any indwelling sin and then being sensitive to his voice about anything special that he has asked us to do. We are, need to be seeking to build a loving community here at Trinity Baptist Church. One of the greatest areas of witness in our society today is disproving people's false ideas about Christianity. And we do this by showing them that the Lord's way is better. In our personal relationships, in marriage, in the way we work, how we run our businesses, how we talk to people, we can show how God's way is better. Any society that abandons God's way is walking down a road covered in broken glass in bare feet. It's going to hurt. Jesus' way has no hazards and he gives us a thick pair of shoes to wear. People will see that we do not have many of the problems that live in a sinful life brings. When people abandon God's way, it often goes wrong and that brings pain and difficulty. When we follow God's way, we're not immune to the troubles of this world. We live in a creation that is um, changed and polluted by sin and we face difficulties. But it's not self-inflicted pain because we are going in God's way. Secondly, we must not be depressed about our own strength. Yes, Trin Trinity Baptist Church is smaller today than it has been in the past. It is weaker and many people are no longer able to support the work here in the way that they would like to because they're getting older. But that does not mean that God is finished with us. Instead, we need to trust in his strength, his power, his wisdom. We need to be praying for the guidance of the Holy Spirit so that when the Lord does present us with an open door, even if it's a small one, we can faithfully walk through it. And when we have learned this secret of faithfulness and the discipline of patient endurance, then we have really learned the lessons that we need from this successful church. Amen.